Tonight, paper tigers. Subpoenas fly from the January 6th committee as a Republican congressman shares anime of violence against AOC. I talked with ex-Republican congressman Joe Walsh about his former party going to violent extremes and what it will take for the fever to break. Plus, clean up aisle 14th amendment. Abraham Lincoln was the great emancipator, but what if, in order to end slavery, he actually broke the Constitution? And what does that mean for the Supreme Court today? And later, no need to pack up your knives just yet. Padma Lakshmi is here to talk about all of my favorite subjects. Food, America, immigration, television, food. Yeah, are you detecting a theme? Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. If you're a regular viewer of this show, you'll be familiar with Arizona Republican Congressman Paul Gosar. He's one of Donald Trump's most ardent supporters and among the more controversial members of Congress. Earlier this year, he spoke at a conference organized by white nationalist Nick Fuentes. He suggested without evidence that the Unite the Right white nationalist rally in Charlottesville in 2017 may have been funded by billionaire Democratic donor George Soros. He made the anti-Semitic claim that Soros handed Jewish people over to the Nazis. He's tweeted out memes with white supremacist mottos. Even his own siblings have called for his removal from office over his extremist views. But now, Gosar has stooped to a brand new low, tweeting a video that depicts violence against elected Democrats. We won't show it to you, but the altered video from a post-apocalyptic anime series shows Gosar killing Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and later attacking President Joe Biden with swords. Twitter added a warning label to the video saying it violated hateful conduct rules, but the platform did not take the video down, saying it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. Sure, Twitter, if you say so. Gosar even retweeted the video on his personal account, adding, the creativity of his team is off the hook. Not sure creative is the word I'd use to describe the animated death of colleagues at your own hands, but... Tomato, tomato. Democratic Congressman Ted Liu called the tweet sick behavior. And just about an hour ago, Gosar issued a statement about what he called the gross mischaracterization of the video, saying, I do not espouse violence or harm towards any member of Congress or Mr. Biden. The cartoon depicts the symbolic nature of a battle between lawful and unlawful policies and in no way intended to be a targeted attack against Representative Cortez or Mr. Biden. It is a symbolic cartoon. It is not real life. Notably, no apology in that. Before that statement, AOC herself fired back, calling Gosar a creepy member, but noted he'll face no consequences because GOP leader Kevin McCarthy cheers him on with excuses. Unfortunately, she does appear to be right. In any other workplace, if someone publicly fantasized about killing a colleague, that person would be fired. But in the grand old party of 2021, McCarthy is shamefully silent about such outrageous behavior by his own caucus members. Just look at conspiracy pusher Marjorie Taylor Greene, too. She railed against the 13 House Republicans who voted for the bipartisan infrastructure bill last week, even posted their phone numbers on Twitter. Now one of those members, Congressman Fred Upton, tells CNN he's getting death threats. Even before Greene's election, she posted an Im image of herself holding a gun next to photos of the squad. She liked and commented on social media posts calling for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's execution. And as reported by Mother Jones, she emphasized protecting the Second Amendment to ward off a tyrannical government in an interview with a gun rights activist one week before Election Day 2020. If this generation doesn't stand up and defend freedom, it's gone. Yeah. And once it's gone, freedom doesn't come back by itself. The only way you get your freedoms back is it's, it's earned with the price of blood. Marjorie Taylor Greene's office did not respond to a request for comment from Mother Jones magazine at the time. But when Greene arrived in Washington, McCarthy welcomed her into the fold, resisting pressure to strip her of her committee assignments over her many incendiary comments. Democrats had to do that on their own. McCarthy may not have stripped Green of her assignments, but according to Punchbowl News, the GOP leadership is bracing for rank-and-file lawmakers to attempt to strip committee assignments from the 13 Republican lawmakers who voted for the $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. 
And as of now, no word from Leader McCarthy on any of this. When it comes to today's GOP, it seems defecting from the party line on a policy issue is a mortal sin, while pushing conspiracies and endorsing violence against other lawmakers is A-OK. -okay. It's almost no wonder that January the 6th happened. Let's not forget, Congressman Gosar has been accused by Stop the Steal organizer Ali Alexander of helping to plan the rally that preceded the Capitol riot in Washington, D.C. that day. Not that his office has ever given us a comment on that on the multiple occasions on which we've asked. Alexander is one of the people under subpoena by the House's January 6th subcommittee, and today they issue new subpoenas for 10 former Trump aides. They include senior advisor Stephen Miller, former press secretary Kayleigh McEnany, deputy chief of staff Chris Liddell, and White House personnel director John McEntee. That follows the six subpoenas for Trump campaign officials and advisors that we told you about on this show yesterday. Former President Trump himself has not been subpoenaed, but he is fighting the release of records requested by the committee. It's not going so well for him at the moment. Late last night, he filed an emergency motion to temporarily shield those records on the basis of executive privilege. Late, late last night. And yet, just two hours later, after midnight, a federal judge swiftly denied it. The judge called the motion Trump's second premature and said she wouldn't entertain it until she ruled on the first motion. I know. I know, court cases, subpoenas, committee hearings, executive privilege, it can be easy to be overwhelmed by all this legal stuff. But don't be. And don't let your eyes glaze over these ongoing political and legal developments in relation to the events of January the 6th. Because at the heart of all of this is the rise of political violence and domestic terror in this country. Violence that reached the halls of Congress this year. Violence that one party is not just ignoring, but dangerously shamelessly normalizing. Joining me now is former congressman and former Republican, Joe Walsh, who now hosts the podcast White Flag with Joe Walsh. Uh, Joe, welcome back to the show. In March, when I spoke to you, you made an interesting prediction about Paul Gosar. Have a listen. You want to know where today's Republican Party, Mehdi, is? You nailed it. Paul Gosar, a guy I got elected with, he blew off. Friday night, he blows off a COVID relief bill to fire up a bunch of white supremacists. And Mehdi, I guarantee you, the Republican Party will not do a damn thing to him. That's where your party is today. That's yeah. where this party is. Sadly, Joe, you were absolutely right. And since then, they've acted to not only look the other way for behavior like that, but they're even thinking about punishing members of Congress who voted for an infrastructure bill, who put country over party, while they allow Gosar to tweet out basically violent threats against other members of Congress. But, Mehdi, I think your open was spot on because I don't think the focus should be on Gosar. Look, I know Gosar, I served with him, he's nuts. I really do think he's nuts. I think there's something wrong with him. He, he, ought to be, he ought to be expelled, he ought to resign. He shouldn't be in Congress. He's a proud white supremacist. He's a proud insurrectionist. He denies Joe Biden won, but Gosar's not the story, Mehdi. I mean, think about it. A member of Congress posted a video of him killing another member of Congress. And it's not just Kevin McCarthy, it's damn near that entire Republican Party hasn't said squat. It's on them, Mehdi, and you're right to focus on the Republican Party. So, they haven't said anything, so and I guess, right, the, your question, the million dollar question is, why not? And I guess, Mehdi, I'd answer it like this. It's Trump's party. There's no difference between Donald Trump and Paul Gosar. There's no difference between Donald Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene. This is the party now. And I'll tell you, Mehdi, you and I have talked about this before. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar are exactly where the average Republican voter is. Unfortunately, that does seem to increasingly be the case when you look at some of the polling on January the 6th and Republicans' views towards 
political violence. Uh, I should add, Paul Gosar, of course, would deny that he's an insurrectionist, would deny some of the claims you made against him. Uh, we have tried to explore on this show his ties to Ali Alexander, Stop the Steal. He doesn't give us any comments. He doesn't come on the show. But let me just focus on this AOC issue in this anime video. If, God forbid, anything were to happen to AOC, is it your argument that not just Paul Gosar has responsibility for that, but Kevin McCarthy and the entire GOP caucus that has turned a blind eye to this? I think the entire party is culpable, Mehdi. And look, I, 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 I hear from hundreds of Republican-based voters every day. I heard from a bunch of them today, Mehdi. They have absolutely no problem with what Paul Gosar did, okay? Kevin McCarthy knows that. Republican Party leadership knows that. And that's why they won't say anything. I guarantee you there will be more violence. Uh, Gosar is inciting violence. But again, Mehdi, what the hell did Donald Trump do for four years? Uh, Gosar's yeah. done nothing that Donald Trump wouldn't do. Yes, that's a very good point. And in fact, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Donald Trump, it's just hitting me now, actually, having spent the entire day thinking about this show and thinking about Paul Gosar. I'm just reminded on air with you, you just triggered it. Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago, they played a video once of, of Trump fans. It wasn't Trump himself, but Trump fans who made a video of him doctored at the Kingsman video, the film, I think it was, where he's slashing and killing loads of people. Again, it was a mock video. It was a fake video. It was a, 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 a you know... But just that, this idea of laughing about violence, of joking about attacking your enemies. I mean, we've gone way beyond just owning the libs here. We're talking about, no, you know, uh, we're talking about a woman, AOC, who gets a lot of death threats already. We're talking about Fred Upton, a Republican member of Congress, who is, says he, today he's getting death threats because Marjorie Taylor Greene called him a traitor and put his phone number, his office number, on Twitter. Mehdi, we're talking about state elections officials all over the country who yes. have been getting death threats for the past almost year because they certified an American election. Remember how outraged we were a few years ago when Trump sent out that one video meme of, of somebody bashing in CNN's head? And then what yes. happened a year later? Somebody tried to, what, set bombs off? Uh, uh, in the in the the Turner headquarters or the CNN office, look, this is inciting violence. This is what this party is, and I guess, Maddie, it's 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 not a surprise. The party is a cult. The cult leader incites violence. The cult leader has lieutenants like Gozar and Marjorie Taylor Greene, and a bunch more who do the same thing. Um, there will be more violence. This is a scary so, time. So let me ask you this. Joe, let me ask you this. You said, it. why now? It's Trump's party. The Republican Party used to be at least a little bit more willing to deal with very problematic members. They eventually, belatedly, stripped Steve King of Iowa of his committee assignments when he was making comments about white civilization and white supremacy. And he was powerless. He was primaried. He was run out of Congress. Uh, but now you have not just Gosar, not just Marjorie Taylor Greene. You have Mo Brooks, who put out a borderline sympathetic statement uh, to the guy who held police at bay in a truck outside the Library of Congress a few weeks ago. And yet nothing. Kevin McCarthy doesn't do anything. Is it because he's afraid of them? He's afraid of Donald Trump? Or the worst scenario of all, he's fine with it all. I think he, I think it's more fear. Mehdi, Gozar and I got elected 10 years ago. I guarantee you, if Paul Gozar pulled this 10 years ago, John Boehner yes. would have grabbed him by the back of the neck. He would have been stripped of his committee assignments. There would have been a price to pay. What happened in the last 10 years? Trump came along, and you and I have talked about this. He radicalized the base. So now the yes. base is fully on board. They're fully radicalized. Most of them support uh, the dangerous crap that Gozar does, Kevin McCarthy knows that. Yeah, and can you imagine if Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib had tweeted out an animated video of them killing Kevin McCarthy or Steve Scalise? Can you imagine the reaction uh, on the Republican side on Fox News? The double standards are so glaring. Uh, but let me ask you this, Joe. We could spend the whole hour talking about double standards and hypocrisy. Let's look forward. What future is there? 
for this former party of yours as it continues its descent into violent authoritarianism. Former New Jersey governor and Trump supporter turned critic Chris Christie was at the Republican Jewish Coalition's conference in Las Vegas this past weekend. Have a listen to what his advice there was. We can no longer talk about the past and the past elections. No matter, no matter where you stand on that issue, no matter where you stand, it is over. Trump, of course, is never one to let even the smallest perceived slight go unanswered. He immediately took a dig at Christie after those remarks, noting how low Christie's approval ratings were, as if Chris Christie wasn't advising him on presidential debates just a year ago. But put that to one side. Put Christie's hypocrisy and Trump's hypocrisy to one side. The substantive argument that he's making there, do you think any Republicans are going to hear or agree with that? It was a pretty tepid response, even in that video clip we just played. No. Many, this is Trump's party. I don't think a damn thing has changed. Donald Trump has as much power now as he did when he was president. My God, we are 10 months removed from a violent attempt to overthrow an election. And Donald Trump's hold on the party now is stronger than it was 10 months ago. Uh, look, one of my good friends, Adam Kinzinger, part, uh, we got elected together 10 years ago. He has no future in this Republican Party. Um, unless you embrace Trump and embrace the big lie, you don't have a future. I don't think, Mehdi, per your open, I don't think the fever breaks in the Republican Party, if at all, for a long, long time. Yeah, my worry, Joe, is that even more violence on the streets of Washington, D.C., God forbid, and we've seen a few attempts at that since 1-6, even that's not going to change anything. No, 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 Mehdi, if a violent attempt to overthrow an election didn't change this radicalized cult, nothing's going to change it. God help us all. Congressman Joe Walsh, former Congressman Joe Walsh, thank you for speaking out as ever. Appreciate it. Still ahead. The party of family values has a doozy on its hand in the Pennsylvania Republican Senate primary and the Missouri one and the Georgia one. We'll bring you up to speed in just 60 seconds. It's pretty shocking. Stay with us. For years, the Republican Party has branded itself as the party of family values. But lately, amid serious accusations of domestic violence against top GOP candidates, radio silence from the party's leadership. Take Sean Parnell, the Trump-endorsed army veteran for the soon-to-be-vacant Senate seat in Pennsylvania. The Philadelphia Inquiry reports last week during a custody hearing, his former wife, quote, testified under oath that he choked her until she bit him to escape, that he hit their young children, and that he lashed out at her with obscenities and insults. In tearful testimony, Lori Snell told a family court judge that her husband once called her a whore and a piece of S while pinning her down. On another occasion, she said, Parnell slapped one child hard enough to leave fingerprint-shaped welts through the back of the child's T-shirt. And she said he once got so angry, he punched a closet door with such force it swung into a child's face and left a bruise. She said Parnell told his child, that was your fault. She also testified that after a Thanksgiving trip in 2008, he briefly forced her out of their vehicle alongside a highway after raging at her, telling her to go get an abortion. Parnell testified Monday he never physically harmed his wife and accused her of lying about photo evidence she presented of injuries to one of their children. And his attorneys pointed out a judge denied a request for a restraining order in 2018 after Snell accused him of physically harming their children. Then there's former football star Herschel Walker, who wants to be the next GOP senator from Georgia. He has Trump's endorsement too, and Mitch McConnell's as well. But according to an investigation by the Associated Press, Quote, in December 2005, Cindy Grossman, Walker's ex-wife, secured a protective order against him, alleging violent and controlling behavior. Grossman has said she was long a victim of Walker's impulses. When his book was released, she told ABC News that at one point during their marriage, her husband pointed a pistol at her head and said, I'm going to blow your effing brains out. She filed for divorce in 2001, citing physically abusive and extremely threatening behavior. Walker has previously said he has disassociative identity disorder and that memory loss is a symptom. And he has said he doesn't remember the incident involving the gun or other ones his former wife has accused him of. There's also Max Miller running for the House in Ohio, again, with Trump's endorsement. The former president called him a great guy. 
But Trump's former communications director, Stephanie Grisham, in the Washington Post opinion section, accused a former boyfriend of being physically abusive. She also told the paper the president, quote, began to tell me how broken up my ex had been about the split and expressed sympathy for him. And though Grisham did not directly name him in the piece, hours later, Max Miller filed suit against Grisham for defamation, claiming she has no proof of misconduct and denying the claims. And then there's Eric Greitens, the GOP Senate candidate in Missouri, who resigned as governor of that state in 2018 after a woman accused him of coercing her into sexual acts, blackmailing her, and physical violence. Greitens says it was a consensual relationship and denies any allegations of violence. A bipartisan Missouri House committee found the woman to be a credible witness. And for months, Senator Rick Scott, head of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, has yet to disown any of them, even when asked directly about Sean Parnell on CNN this week. But let's also not forget Larry Elder, the Trump ally who was a Republican gubernatorial candidate during the California recall election in September. His ex fiance says she broke off an 18-month engagement with the conservative talk show host in 2015 after he waved a gun at her while high on marijuana. Elder has denied that ever happened. But that's two top Republican candidates this year alone, both accused of pointing guns at their partners. Taken together, those are five candidates who've been accused of domestic violence, three of whom have been endorsed by Donald J. Trump. How is this okay? How in 2021 can party leaders on the Republican side not just look past these allegations, including gun waving and choking, but actually endorse these candidates? Still ahead. Four score and 70 years ago, it turns out the man who gave the Gettysburg Address may have broken the Constitution in order to end slavery. Oh well, nobody's perfect. That story is ahead in 60 seconds. In the news business, we cover politics and immigration on an almost daily basis. But Padma Lakshmi is looking at these issues through a new and very different lens. The second season of her show, Taste the Nation, is now available on Hulu. It's a fascinating show in which she explores the cuisines that are now as American as apple pie and the people behind them who aren't always welcomed in America. The violence of the drug cartels in recent years has made El Paso residents afraid to go to Juarez. On top of that, Central Americans and Mexicans are being increasingly vilified in the U.S. We literally walled off the two cities and families have been separated and jailed. America loves Mexican food. In fact, we eat more salsa than we do ketchup. But what about the hands that make that food? Taste the Nation isn't your typical fluffy food tourism show. As Salon's Ashley Stevens wrote when the show first premiered last year, this series is one that explores just how interconnected food, tradition and personhood are. And in a country that is an undeniable melting pot, what has happened as the personhood of certain immigrant groups becomes politicized. Her immigrant story is also woven in through the episodes. In Lakshmi's hands, Taste the Nation serves as a meditation on whose contributions to our country have been recognized and commodified and whose have not. And put simply, it's about looking up from your plate and acknowledging the person who made the food served on it. It's an ambitious project in an already ambitious career. Lakshmi is a former model, the host and executive producer of Top Chef, an activist, a UNICEF goodwill ambassador and the author of multiple books, including this year's children's book, Tomatoes for Neela. Earlier, I spoke with Padma Lakshmi. Padma, thanks so much for joining me on the show tonight. Congratulations on the new book and the new season of Taste the Nation. Um, when that first season of that show on Hulu came out last year, you said Taste the Nation is a political show just under the guise of food porn. Uh, it's a great line, but unpack it for our viewers. What exactly did you mean by that? How is it a political show? Um, well, you know, we look at the issue of immigration through the communities that we visit. Um, some who have been here for a really long time, some who have been here more recently. And I think food is very political. You can look at so many issues that affect our lives and our culture, from agriculture to commerce to health and safety to, of course, the environment. And you can tell a lot about a person and a culture by how they eat. And so 
I'm interested in those stories. For so long, I saw, you know, for several years, I saw immigrants being vilified uh, in the media and in Washington with the prior administration. And as an immigrant and as someone who's grown up in immigrant communities, that just wasn't my experience. And I was tired of other people speaking for immigrants, about immigrant life, or about yes. who we were, or who we weren't. And so um, I began to work on immigration issues with uh, the ACLU. And out of that um, advocacy work, I really uh, came away with the feeling that, you know, we don't know our fellow Americans. And so Taste the Nation isn't really designed for people who think like me. It's really designed for people who vote red or are in red states and maybe intimidated. I don't want to call it xenophobia in all cases, but maybe just are afraid of the other. And I thought that, you know, getting to know these immigrant communities and letting them tell their own story would be really yes. refreshing and hopefully open up a dialogue. It's designed for people who don't think like me. You go to some fascinating places on the show. I want to play a little clip from your second season of Taste the Nation. Let's have a listen. can't forget that the immigrant story is constantly replaying itself. I feel like they're just good ghosts, yes. A Jewish woman might bring her Irish neighbor latkes, and the Irish woman might bring clam chowder. We didn't just blissfully go down and greet the pilgrims and go, oh, welcome, we have turkey. You Want know. an apple pie? Yeah. yeah. Noche Buena is all about a feeling. The feeling you have with your family, with your community. Hey, that sound? Sound of joy. Padma, what would you say, looks fascinating and I'm already hungry now, what would you say to the skeptic who says a lot of xenophobes or racists, people who don't like immigration, want to build a wall, they actually don't have any problem with quote unquote immigrant or ethnic food. They love the food. It's the people behind the food that they want to keep out. Exactly. There seems to be this real disconnect between their political policies that they espouse and their daily lives. I'll never forget when I think somebody sent a mariachi band to some Republican lawmaker who was eating Mexican food. I, you know, I will not name the person because that's not what we're here to talk about, but um, which I thought was kind of splendid and it's grandeur, you know. Um, and it's true, you know, yeah. people are happy to enjoy immigrant food, but they never think about the hands making that food. And, you know, we all love Thai food. What do we know about the Thai American story? Well, there are many uh, stories, but one is this community in Las Vegas of, of war brides who married GIs and came over because it's a huge, you know, Air Force base. Of course, Nellis Air Force base is there. I shot there years ago for Top Chef, and I was fascinated by this community of largely women, you know, in that first generation and how enterprising they were. And, you know, our country is unique in that it is completely built by and evolved out of immigration, waves and waves of immigration. And so that is something that is so intrinsic to American culture that it's, it's part of who we are as Americans, more than other countries, I believe. Yes. And so I really wanted to look at that. I wanted to lean into that. I wanted to do it in an artistic and creative um, way in my professional life. You know, take my advocacy and sort of get off my soapbox and do it in a more entertaining way um, to hopefully you know, be a catalyst for more understanding and, and more conversation. Between well, I'm so, I'm so glad you're doing this, and I hope it is a catalyst. Uh, I'm also glad that back in August, you were one of the people who helped shut down uh, the Washington Post columnist, uh, Gene Weingarten, when he said Indian food was, quote, the only ethnic cuisine in the world insanely based entirely on one spice, a line that has since been corrected and altered by the Post. What was your instinctive, very first reaction when you read that, read that piece, saw those ridiculous comments, and why did it matter so much to push back against them? Honestly, I just thought that it was a stupid column that was not funny or true, and so had no reason to take up so many column inches in a venerated paper like the Washington Post. I could think of many writers, talented writers, who could use that space, and I think, you know, this guy has a column. I don't have anything against him. I just 
have stuff against the remarks he made because I grew up being taunted and teased and bullied by exactly the same kind of comments by kids in the school cafeteria. And that's what this felt like. This felt like middle school yeah. bullying. You know, that it was just this mush that was a bunch of uh, pureed snails was another line from it. I mean, I can't believe we're still talking about this piece, but it did cause a <laughs> bit of a, a couple. But well, it, just, it just it irritated me so much, you know? And I, I felt I, like telling him, actually the snails are in the French food that you, you know, espouse loving so much. Indian food is actually... I guess I had a... <laughs> sadly, I think a lot of brown people watching this had a similar experience in school. I know I did back in England as the children of immigrants, as brown people. Yes, there was a time when Indian food was much mocked. To have it now when it's dominating the parts of the world is just very odd. Um, you mentioned racist bullying in school. What do you make of the racism in America today and the quote unquote white lash that we're seeing, which is especially taking place, see Virginia, in our schools, where schools and school boards have become the centerpiece for this backlash, where people are hiding behind critical race theory, but it's not the critical or the theory that they have a problem with, it's the race. You know, I, I really think that racism is born of ignorance. And uh, this furor over imaginary race theory being taught in our schools, uh, it is not. It is not taught in 12 through K. So it's a completely fabricated fear that's been stoked by the right in order to manipulate um, the electorate along with gerrymandering, along with, you know, uh, thwarting voting rights for everybody. So it is a systemic ploy to um, raise uh, the fear of people who are um, intimidated by the by the country uh, evolving to look like something other than them. And, you know, I can imagine that's scary, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be at all. And it feels like a dog whistle to me. That's what it feels like. It's yeah. just ridiculous. One of the other areas you've been outspoken on uh, is women's rights, uh, abortion rights. Um, in Texas recently, we have this law that was passed, one of the strictest anti-abortion laws in the country. Supreme Court uh, now hearing that case. Supreme Court about to hear a case uh, out of Mississippi, which could lead to the end uh, of Roe v. Wade. How worried are you about the direction of the U.S. when it comes to women's rights, abortion rights? You have a young daughter, I believe. Are these subjects you talk to her about? I mean, Krishna, my daughter is 11, so she's aware because she always hears me on the phone or, you know, she knows about this issue because obviously we've been, you know, I've been pretty vocal about it. Um, and reproductive health care is something I've been concerned with also with the Endometriosis Foundation of America, which we started and, and founded over a decade ago. But I, you know, I can't believe we're still having this conversation. If... Um, if more men, you know, if they're not trans, I mean, you know what I'm saying, like if men could get pregnant very easily, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, I really, I really believe that in this day and age to tell a woman that she has to do something and she doesn't have dominion over her body is apocryphal under any circumstances. It should be, you know, we shouldn't even talk about the exceptions for rape or incest. It just should not be a question. My body is my business. And your body and what you do or don't do with it, it should be your business. End of story. You know, it's just that simple. And I think, again, it, it is really the religious right that is taking over the legislature in all these states and, of course, also the Supreme Court. Interestingly, Republicans over the last year and a half of the pandemic seem to have agreed with you. They say, my body, my choice when it comes to masks. So maybe they're yes, halfway there. Exactly. Uh, one, last, one last quick question. We're out of time, but I've got to ask. Speaking, you mentioned your daughter. Speaking of kids, tell us about your new book, Tomatoes for Neela. My kids happen to be obsessed with both cooking and storytelling. So I'm wondering, how did you end up doing a children's book like this? And why tomatoes? Oh, thank you for mentioning the tomatoes for Neela. Um, you know, it's been a lifelong dream of mine to write a children's book. I love children's literature, and I thoroughly savored and enjoyed reading to my daughter, Krishna, at every stage. And we used to, and still do, always cook together. And I think children are just such great sponges for information. And I believe that a narrative structure of a 
children's picture book is a great way to teach kids about food. And so if you give a child an appreciation and love of food and cooking at a young age, you give them the gift of good eating for long after you're gone and that will benefit them. And so I just taught Krishna how to cook in little age appropriate ways at different stages of her development. And so Tomatoes for Mila is, um, and hopefully an entertaining guide for, to help parents do that. I picked tomatoes because they're so ubiquitous in our culture and um, you know, yes. kids at least know about ketchup. And so I thought it was a good gateway vegetable or fruit, I guess, to, to tell them about history, to, to tell them That's... about the many hands that also have to do, uh, uh, to also tell them about the many hands that um, contribute to the food chain. There's also a section in the back about farm workers um, and there's also nutritional facts and there's a couple recipes because I think kids need to understand that their food comes from somewhere and people are responsible for it and it's their part in our planet to also eat responsibly. Well said. The book is called Tomatoes for Nila. The TV show is Taste the Nation. Padma Lakshmi, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much for having me on. Have a good evening. Just ahead, is our constitution broken? That's what one Harvard lawyer who testified at the first impeachment of Donald Trump argues in his new book. I'll speak to Professor Noah Feldman in 90 seconds about lots of important things. Don't go away. What were the Founding Fathers thinking when they wrote the Constitution? It's not just a random musing any one of us might have. It's a question that lives and breathes at the heart of this country's biggest, most contentious legal battles, sometimes to an obsessive degree. And it'll factor into how many of our Supreme Court justices will look at and rule on a major upcoming abortion case in Mississippi. Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization is about whether Mississippi's ban on abortions 15 weeks after pregnancy is unconstitutional. The state is arguing it's perfectly legal because Roe v. Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood, the 1992 case that affirmed the Roe decision, are actually, quote, irreconcilable with constitutional text and historical meaning, adding that it provides compelling grounds to overrule them. They're basically saying those rulings were unconstitutional because they're not covered by the 14th Amendment. And they say history doesn't show a deeply rooted right to abortion. I mean, it also doesn't show a deeply rooted right to quadruple bypass surgery either. Nevertheless, how much should history and what the 14th Amendment, which wasn't ratified until 1868, matter in 2021 America? Well, some of the conservative justices on the Supreme Court who consider themselves originalists or textualists would say the law is grounded only in what the framers intended when they wrote it in the late 18th century, well ahead of the 14th Amendment. And one of those justices is, of course, Amy Coney Barrett. It's not the law of Amy, it's the law of the American people. And I think originalism and textualism, to me, boil down to that, to a commitment to the rule of law, to not disturbing or changing or updating or, you know, adjusting in, cons in line with my own policy preferences what that law requires. But other legal scholars think in the hundreds of years that have passed, there's room for reinterpretation, for new circumstances, that the law is dynamic. But what if all this back and forth around what the founding fathers wanted is irrelevant? What if the Constitution as we know it today is actually broken, has been broken? And what if it's revered Republican, revered American icon Abraham Lincoln, who's the one who did it? That's what a new book argues, The Broken Constitution, Lincoln, Slavery and the Refounding of America. In an op-ed adapted from his book, Harvard constitutional law professor Noah Feldman writes that Lincoln created a more moral constitution. He consciously and repeatedly violated core elements of that constitution as they had been understood by nearly all Americans of the time, himself included. Through those acts of destruction, Lincoln effectively broke the constitution of 1787, paving the way for something very different to replace it. So how does Noah Feldman's provocative new thesis change what we know about our Constitution? How did Abraham Lincoln's radical moves change America? And if the Constitution was broken once, can it be broken again? Law Professor Noah Feldman, author of The Broken Constitution, uh, joins me now. Uh, Professor Feldman, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. Kids are taught in elementary school 
about the Founding Fathers. I was tested on them when I did my citizenship test last year. But you, all, you seem to be suggesting that they're all kind of irrelevant now in constitutional terms because it's Abraham Lincoln who's responsible for our current, and you say, broken constitution. Briefly explain to our viewers how so. The original constitution, the 1787 constitution, fundamentally consisted of a compromise over slavery. That is to say that the North felt that many of them in the North, many whites in the North did not want to see slavery in the Constitution, but the South insisted on it, Southern whites insisted on it. And in three ways, which maybe weren't on the citizenship test, they enshrined slavery in the Constitution. They promised that the slave trade would remain in place internationally for 20 years. They put in the three-fifths compromise that counted African Americans as just three-fifths of a person. And they put in the Fugitive Slave Clause, which said that if an enslaved person escaped to a free state, that person would not become free but would instead be sent back to slavery. And those provisions were part of a pragmatic compromise that then lasted until the Civil War that was not a moral compromise. It was an immoral compromise, and it was based on the perpetuation of slavery. Then, with the Civil War, the Constitution genuinely was broken. Lincoln broke the Constitution in several ways, but the most significant way in which he did it was through the Emancipation Proclamation, where he broke the constitutional protection on slavery in a permanent way, and thereby broke the arrangements that we had. That was actually a good thing. It needed so, to be broken. I was going to say, do you think that's a good thing? But you beat me to it. You are saying that was a good thing, that he broke the Constitution in order to win the Civil War, in order to end slavery. Um, in the New York Times review of your book, Sean Willentz writes that your depiction of the Constitution's connection to slavery is questionable. He says you ignore the anti-slavery currents inside the federal convention that challenged and sometimes defeated the pro-slavery delegates, that you cut corners and make Lincoln seem like an elected tyrant uh, who emancipated the slaves. What is your response to that? Is that how we should view Lincoln? Well, let me take them in reverse order then. You know, Lincoln, by his own lights, broke the Constitution. He said in his first inaugural address, which no one ever quotes, that he was committed to the preservation of slavery because the Constitution guaranteed and protected it. And when one of his generals started to free slaves at the beginning of the war, Lincoln fired the general, reversed the orders, and wrote to a friend that to free slaves would be an act of dictatorship. So Lincoln, by his own words, reached the opposite conclusion a little more than a year later when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. As for what happened in the 1787 convention, I think Professor Wilentz is just overstating the case drastically. I mean, I wrote a book about the Founding Fathers, as did uh, Wilentz, although we have very different conclusions. And the fact that some Founding Fathers were uncomfortable with slavery is irrelevant to the fact that the Constitution they produced enshrined slavery, was understood by the vast majority of Americans, including the Supreme Court, as doing so, and continued to do so right up until the Civil War. And even a person like Abraham Lincoln, who didn't care for slavery, began the war believing that slavery was a mandatory part of the so, Constitution. So, Professor Feldman, we're only a couple of minutes into the interview, and we're already talking about what did they think, what was going on, what was said. And I just think to myself, it's not like other countries don't have a codified legal document, a Constitution. Most Western democratic countries do. But I find that only in America do people fetishize the Constitution and the people who wrote it as some kind of almost infallible beings, guides, prophets even. And for me, to be honest, whether it was a group of white men in the 1780s or a single white man in the 1860s, it's now 2021. Why should a modern, democratic, multiracial America still be beholden to those guys' views of the law, of politics, of the Constitution? Shouldn't we be freeing ourselves from this obsession with their views, their words, their intentions in 2021? The way we Americans often find ourselves arguing about what's right is by arguing about whether it's in the Constitution. And on some level, that's kind of silly because what really matters is what's right, not what's, what's, what's written in the Constitution. But, and this is, I think, really important and significant, we still remain committed to the idea of interpreting the Constitution to make it the best Constitution that it can be. Now, I'm not an originalist. I think originalism is a mistaken approach because I think that any time you interpret the Constitution, even if you claim to be an originalist, you're bringing your own beliefs and values to it. And we do better when we're honest about the fact that we're bringing our beliefs yes. and values to it. So in that sense, I don't think we should be bound by the dead hand of the past. But, and this is a big but, we still divide 
we still create our national identity around what we think we're collectively committed to as values. And that means that if we're worried that our constitution has racism baked into it from the beginning, we're going to do a worse job of evolving our constitution to be better and more equal. We'll do a better job if instead of starting with the slaveholders in 1787, we start with the self-liberation of enslaved people during the Civil War and with Abraham Lincoln's promise that slavery would not be returned to the constitution and with our constitutional amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, that say that all humans are equal. That's where we need to start that story because it's a story about how we get along and that we do need. So let's not just talk about dead hands. Let's talk about the Constitution today and the Supreme Court today. Uh, your liberal endorsement of Amy Coney Barrett's nomination last year was cited by everyone from Donald Trump to Matt Gates, which I'm sure you loved. They loved your op-ed for Bloomberg in which you said Amy Coney Barrett deserves to be on the Supreme Court. I disagree with Trump's judicial nominee on almost everything, but I still think she's brilliant. You also called her lovely, kind and thoughtful, which she may very well be. But it's kind of irrelevant, is it not, to the people on the receiving end of her decisions, whether it's women, workers, minorities, etc. And I wonder, Professor Feldman, I wonder what you think about this idea that a lot of Americans who say they hate the establishment, they hate the swamp, they look at stuff like this and they say, everyone's just friends with each other. It's not about ideology. It's not about politics. You endorsed her despite everything. So I wish you'd shown the clip where on national television I said that Donald Trump should be impeached and removed from the presidency, which was long before he put Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court. I said that under oath. I believed it. I believe it still. Uh, Donald Trump twice committed crimes and misdemeanors that deserved impeachment. However, the Senate did not remove him. He was elected yeah. president of the United States the first time, and he is entitled to nominate somebody, and the Senate is entitled to vote on that person. When I wrote that uh, op-ed, it was absolutely clear that Justice Barrett would be confirmed, as indeed she was. What I was speaking in was a, an idiom that we used to believe in in this country, where we could say, as it says right in that clip, that you can disagree with, something, with someone about almost everything, still believe that the person is acting in good conscience, and not treat that person as your absolute enemy, but as a person with whom you have disagreement. And I would add one more thing. Many people said, if she goes on the Supreme Court, she's going to hand the presidency to Donald Trump, even if he loses the election. When I wrote that, it was very important to me to emphasize that I did not believe she would do that and to send her the message that we are a system where we believe in the rule of law, as you had a clip of her saying, and that meant she should not hand over the election to Donald Trump, as indeed she did not do. And so I think that's really important. Indeed. We used to have a system where we remembered that sometimes we're going to lose and not get the people we want through. And when that happens, we need to remind those people to be committed to those things that we hold in common. We can't win them all. You know, elections have consequences. I'm devastated yeah. by the thought that the court might overturn Roe v. Wade. I don't want that to happen. And there was literally nothing that could be done about that by throwing pointless insults at Justice Barrett. So a couple of things. I'm not suggesting you should throw pointless insults, nor were we suggesting you're a Trump supporter. I did say in the intro, uh, as I introduced you, that you did speak in his first impeachment trial. My point about Coney Barrett, and there's two arguments here that you seem to have raised, one of which is about elections and consequences, which I totally agree with you, although the critics would say that's more to do with should she have been confirmed so close to an election after millions of Americans had voted? What about McConnell's hypocrisy? Let's put that to one side, a discussion for another day. I just want to engage with you on, on her rulings and your point about the Supreme Court, because it's fascinating. I agree with you. She didn't hand the election to Donald Trump, although that's a low bar. You know, the Supreme Court didn't overturn democracy. I don't think they deserve a pat on the back for not doing that. But I just wonder, in hindsight, given she did vote with the majority on Brnovich, the voting rights, the big voting rights case this year, she has voted against labor rights, she has voted against uh, the rights of juvenile offenders, she's even signed on to that, you know, the Texas SB8 decision, which is obviously now in the full court, but back in September stopped women in Texas overnight from getting abortions. I just wonder, in hindsight, do you regret anything you wrote or said at the time about Coney Barrett? Those are all wrong decisions, in my view, wrongly interpreting our statutes and our constitution. None of them surprises me. And they don't change what I said, which is that I disagree with her. I'm likely to continue to disagree with her very strongly. But she is a first class lawyer, a deeply thoughtful and conscientious person, and is capable of being a good Supreme Court justice by the lights of sincerity, conscientiousness, and effort. I think she will not be a great Supreme Court justice if she decides cases wrong, and I think those cases are wrongly decided. 
but it was never my point to say that I agreed with her. And as I say, we used to live in a political system where it was possible to say about somebody, I disagree with you profoundly and I still respect you. And I think it's very sad that we're in a world where people think that saying that is somehow either an act of betrayal or an act of bravery. I don't know which was worse when people told me that I somehow had betrayed my constitutional values because I said that someone was smart whom I disagree with or whether people, when people on the other side said I, I was so brave. You know, that's I, I ridiculous too. It's neither brave nor, I completely it's neither understand. brave or preposterous. I completely understand the argument you're making, and there's a lot of value in it. I guess the critics would say it's more about the fact that it's, it's irrelevant whether she's smart or nice. It only matters what her decisions are because that's what impacts real people. Right. And that's but we're I'm running saying, out of time, and I do point, want to ask wrong. about... That's wrong. Okay. I mean, it's a mistake to that's... think that it's irrelevant what someone's motivations are because if they have bad motives, then they will do things like overturn... Well, we don't know what her like... motives are. Neither of us know what her motives are. I mean, you know, her, you know her, I don't know her, but we don't really know her motives. But let's just move on. We're running out of time. I do want to get into a bigger issue about the court. You've written recently about what happens if Roe v. Wade is overturned by this court, and you've warned conservative justices court packing, expanding the court by the Democrats will be coming much sooner if they do that. I happen to be someone who supports expanding the court regardless of what happens on Roe. I think it's the right thing to do. I think Democrats have every right to do it. Why am I wrong? Well, as a constitutional matter, whoever controls Congress and the presidency could always expand the court. So when you yeah. say that, Mehdi, you're not just saying that the Democrats can do it, you're saying the Republicans can do it if they are in control of the government, as they have been in the recent past and could very well be in 2024. So take a deep breath before embracing an expansion of the court that could happen uh, from the other side. So there I think the issue is, if both sides get in this business of whoever controls Congress and the presidency will expand the court, that will undermine the court's ability to do things like give us gay rights, give us trans rights, uh, expand abortion rights, which is the court's history, although it may be about to do something different. It has not gone that way in the past. In the past, the court has expanded reproductive rights very substantially. And so the question comes down to, do you believe that the Supreme Court on the whole has been a good thing for liberal and progressive values? And my view is, in most of the last century, it has been a very good thing, without which we would not have had gay marriage, we would not have trans rights, we would not have reproductive rights. And I want to preserve the institution that's capable of doing that, unless the court fundamentally reverses course, in which case I think there will be tremendous pressure if the Democrats have the votes to pack the court, and that will probably break the legitimacy of the court. Yeah. I guess, I guess my response, and we've run out of time, would be that Republicans already changed the size of the court. They kept it at eight for a whole year. So doing things because you worry Republicans might do bad things... That was in the, the 1870s. Wise, that's they that's already a, that's do, a long time. They already do bad things without Democrats inciting them. But anyways, we're out of time. That was a fascinating conversation. Noah Feldman, thank you so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on the book. It's called The Broken Constitution. Before we go tonight... It's been five years, but the NBA is back at the White House, a tradition that was interrupted in 2016 when Donald Trump became president. The Milwaukee Bucks were honored for winning the 2021 NBA title. The president also applauded their activism during the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Biden singled out MVP Yanis and his brother Thanasis, who also play for the Bucks, saying the family won the Gene Pool Lottery. Son's living the dream of an immigrant family from Nigeria and then Greece in search of new opportunity and struggles they always dreamed. Brothers who once had to share the same basketball shoes, all five of them, and before they got to the NBA. I tell you what, I, I would have liked to have been there when you, that fight went on. Who got the shoes when? After the president spoke, uh, Yanni spoke, took to the podium, calling it an awesome experience and an unbelievable journey. It's an unbelievable opportunity to be able to be in the White House, uh, meeting uh, the President of the United States. I could not be um, as honored and happy that uh, something like this have, have come, something like this in my life. For everybody out there, uh, this is a great example that, you know, with hard work, uh, with sacrifices, if you dedicate yourself and waking up every single day, and try to um, get better in anything you do, in anything you love, and believing in your dreams, you can accomplish great things in life. Inspiring words from an inspiring person. And thank God, athletes, role models like him, feel able to go back to the White House now. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. 
And I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. right here on The Choice from MSNBC. One of my guests will be Huma Abedin. You won't want to miss that conversation tomorrow night. But for now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.